Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Viet. I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, welcome. Um, welcome to today's program on Changing the Tide, a Canadian Perspective on Afghanistan. Just a word about the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, for those of you who are watching this on the webcast and those of you who haven't been here before, we were founded in 1968 by the United States Congress as a living memorial to the 28th president, our only president with a PhD. He felt that we ought to bridge the world of policy and the academic world, Wilson having been president of Princeton, governor of New Jersey, and then president of the United States, but also knew that policymakers and scholars did not often speak with each other. And actually delighted to see General Leslie's um, CV this morning that he's pursuing a PhD, so he's going to be both. Um, <laughs> so with programs like this, we try to encourage discussion among government, business, the scholarly community, to really encourage dialogue. Um, we don't have a set agenda. The Wilson Center itself does not promote policy or legislation. We, what we really promote is people talking to each other. Um, there's about 22 programs at the Wilson Center, of which the Canada Institute is one. And we have about 50 scholars and residents at any one time. Now, the Canada Institute itself works to increase awareness and knowledge about Canada and Canada-U.S. issues among policymakers and opinion leaders. We were founded in 2001 at the suggestion of former Ambassador Raymond Chrétien. We work generally in three areas, energy and environment, trade, borders and border security, but when we have an opportunity like this to look into something else or political or military or something important in the world, we jump at it and we're delighted we can do this today. Um, upcoming programs on November 17th, we have a program on Buy American, Creating or Costing U.S. Jobs. This is on Tuesday the 17th. And on Wednesday, December 16th, Changing Climates in North American Politics on uh, climate change in and around the Copenhagen Summit. Um, I'd also like to thank our prog uh, programs at the Senate Asia Program and the International Security Studies Program for working with us on this event. Um, I met General Leslie several years ago at a breakfast at the Canadian Embassy. Um, and it was a small breakfast, and it was completely off the record. Um, and it, he gave the most honest assessment on Afghanistan I've ever heard anyone give ever. Um, and I thought if we could ever get him here, I'd be really lucky. I saw him again in April in Toronto and asked if he might come, and he said yes. So I'm delighted that he's here. You do have a uh, short biography of uh, General Leslie, but I would like to point out a few items in his impressive career. He's chief of land staff for the Canadian Forces having had considerable and wide military experience. He served in Yugoslavia in the 1990s where he was Chief of S Staff Sector South um, and was awarded the Meritorious Service Medal for his actions under fire during the fighting for Kanin in August 1995. He then became Chief of Staff and Deputy Commander of UNCRO Division Level and finally Chief of Staff of the United Nations Protection Forces. Later, Lieutenant General Leslie was appointed Commander Task Force Kabul and Deputy Commander of the NATO-led International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, in Afghanistan as of June 2003, and on his return, he was awarded the Meritorious Service Cross. And I would like to thank his colleagues at the Embassy here for coming here and also for giving me the poppy. Those of you Americans who don't know, please ask those with the poppy what it stands for, and you'll have a great conversation. Please help me welcome General Leslie. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks for joining us here on a beautiful Washington uh, fall day. Um, one addenda, uh, pursuing a PhD is the operative term. <laughs> Slowly, <laughs> grindingly. Anyways, thanks a lot for your participation here. With your concurrence, uh, I will talk for a few minutes show you a quick video of what our young men and women are doing right now in Afghanistan, and then open it up for your questions. I'd recommend holding your questions until the end of my relatively short presentation, but after that, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm a general, quite a senior one in the Canadian Forces. I run the Canadian Army with a whole bunch of folk to give me a hand, and so if there are questions which are blatantly political, I'm not going to answer them, because I did not run for office. However, if there's wiggle room and room for interpretation, I'd be delighted to take a crack at them. If I can answer something, I will. And if I won't, I won't, and I'll tell you why. So, without further ado, a quick setting of the scene. 
This is a map of Afghanistan. The key point to note is all the various provinces and the various national flags scattered across that savage and rugged terrain populated by, in the main, rugged, tough, individualistic, fiercely proud, natural warriors, very few of whom actually represent one complete block that think in the same way and operate according to the same rules or laws. The key of this slide is the PRT, Provincial Reconstruction Team Locations. And as has been true throughout the sweep of history, soldiers, counterinsurgencies or counterterrorism activities or indeed what some would call euphemistically the good old days of conventional war, we're there to buy time. Buy time for our political masters to try and arrive at a series of settlements as to how they want the outcomes to be determined. We buy time with blood and treasure. Sometimes we fight for it, sometimes we build, we shape. The purpose of me showing you this slide is each one of those national flags is a different national PRT. And they do wonderful work, truly wonderful work, and an essential part of our exit strategy. At some point, we want to be able to turn Afghanistan over to a functioning state with their own set of rules of law, their own judicial systems, which are relatively independent. But the problem is, they're all operating to slightly drifting drumbeats. And the coherence amongst and between the reconstruction priorities is very often nationally driven, instead of being Afghan driven under a unified whole. Separate funding lines, separate responsibilities to go back to a whole bunch of national capitals of good folk who've contributed their men and women to the fray. And what is lacking is that coherence. Because quite frankly, for societies that go back two, two and a half millennia, whether or not you're on the border between Kandahar and Helmand is moot. Where you consider the border of your tribal lands is an immutable. That's been fixed long before my ancestors stopped clubbing each other when they were dressed in blue paint. They came from Scotland, by the way. Yeah. There's a Scottish member of the audience who said they still do it. I have no comment. On the right, you see the relative numbers of troops that each nation is committed to the fray. Those numbers need some explanation. Not all your national contributions will be shown, because not all soldiers are actually declared to ISAF, because there's national restrictions and they're doing national tasks. But in this case, Canada has roughly 3,000 soldiers. The vast majority of them are in the province of Kandahar. And it's tough. Afghanistan's a hard place. Kandahar is a tough province. Next slide. The Afghan insurgency. Counterinsurgency theory has been written about, talked about, acted on, not for years, but indeed centuries. And it all boils down to the hearts and minds and getting the local population to respect their rule of law, to impose their will on their peoples. So it's a question of building institutional capacity. At the same time, there has to be a certain degree of freedom of action to close with and destroy those elements with whom you can't discuss, you can't negotiate. And they rep represent such an extremist point of view that unfortunately, in many cases, there's only one way to deal with them. And that's to use violence to stop them from getting through us with their aim being to hurt the weak and the innocent whom we are charged to protect. So in the center, you've got the local population. You've got the nascent Af Afghan government and institutions, and they are nascent. You've got the insurgent groups, which, by the way, aren't one block. There's a multiplicity of them. There's sometimes a bewildering array of linkages, of differentiators uh, between the, uh, the opposing forces. And then, of course, you have the external actors. Those folk who have volunteered their time and their treasure, their young men and women, military and civilian, to go to Afghanistan and try to do good. And that is a really short list. 
because that last count there weren't hundreds, but there were thousands of different actors from the international communities and governments, all hard at work in that country. Coordination and synchronization, unity of effort, is fraught with difficulty and challenges. Having said all that, like a whole bunch of other Canadians, I got quite a lot of experience in complex multinational missions. And we, the international community, have come an awfully long way since the days of the former Yugoslavia and before, where everything operated in a stovepipe. So we've come enormous distances, but there's always, always room for improvement. Let me talk about friendly forces. That is the most sophisticated weapon system on a modern battlefield. Probably around 25 years old, happens to be a Canadian. Infantry, the tip of the spear, boots on the ground. You can't instill confidence in local security institutions, nor can you act as a calming influence and a visible sign that others care and are willing to risk their lives to protect the locals without getting your feet out and either dusty or muddy. He's very good at what he does. He's probably on his second or third tour if he's in a supervisory rank. He's volunteered twice, once to join the Canadian Army, second time to go overseas. I'm in an extraordinarily fortunate position as Army commander. We send 3,000 a brigade overseas every six months, where I still have more soldiers who want to go than I have slots to send them. And so mine is the job, along with my command team, to stop folk going back in their third, fourth, fifth, sixth tour until they can get a bit of a break. Soldiers believe in the mission, believe in their training, believe in what they're doing. But like all soldiers in Western worlds, we fight the good fight. We'll fight it so long as we're told to fight it. We're told to come home, and the only reply we give is, yes, sir. Now, there's going to be an organization diagram. Why? Two reasons. I'm an Army guy. You've got to have one in a presentation. And I'm going to walk you through what it means. So every six months, this is the force package that we send overseas. At the top, you got a square with an X, and that's a brigade headquarters, led by the tough, competent young brigadier generals, very good at what they do. We spend a long time training them, local languages and cultures, affiliations. We send a large number of them down to the States to your Monterey school. A lot of them have, indeed, I can't think of any in the recent six or seven, who don't have at least two or three degrees. They're at the top of their game in terms of their professional expertise, and they're surrounded by a command team, which helps them get the job done, uh, which is truly extraordinary. Now, let me bring your attention down to the bottom left. The infantry battle group is the hammer. And that is roughly 13 to 1,400 tough young Canadian soldiers, regular and reserve, whose job it is to close with and destroy the foe. They're the hammer. We'll talk more about what they have in a couple of seconds. Below them, you've got an intelligence company, and we have come collectively as an alliance with our good friends the United States and the United Kingdom we have come light years in terms of synchronizing human intelligence, electronic intelligence, signals intelligence into fusion centers that allow us to try and discern with a fair degree of certainty friend from foe in a counterinsurgency fight, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Because the last thing we want to do is make a mistake. And for every mistake that's made, you are triggering a response which is probably disproportional, but you know you've just recruited a whole bunch of angry young men who are willing to come and hurt your soldiers or those whom you're trying to protect. So the use of force has got to be extraordinarily caught, thought through and extremely precise. Then you've got the omelet, the observer mentor liaison team. That's roughly a battalion-sized organization composed of a multiplicity of teams, and they live sleep, fight, eat, and occasionally die alongside the Afghan battalions that they're training. They start their tour by walking out the front gate, and usually they see the front gate five or six months later. 
So we were the first to start this sort of live, sleep, eat, and fight with the Afghans, and it's working extraordinarily well. And by the way, I was on the first graduation parade of the first battalion of the Afghan army in 2003. And like any battalion that was grown from the ruins, if you would, of what at one time was a very potent force but was slightly battered over some intervening years, they were okay. The ones that we deal with in Kandahar right now are damned good. That is not true across the rest of the country. But the ones that we deal with, the ones that we have our soldiers living with and fighting with, are very good. Natural warriors, ferocious, very proud of their country, very proud of their mission, a blend of ethnicities and tribal groups, and very, very tough. We don't go out unless we're accompanying Afghan soldiers. And more and more, we're trying to move to the point where they are starting to take command of very complex operations. At company, battalion, not quite yet brigade-sized, where you have three, four, five, six thousand troops and supporters all moving together, but it's not far away. It's very, very close. The engineer support unit, essentially an engineer regiment, they help with reconstruction, they help with counter IED, which is the bane of our existence. Uh, they do vertical construction, but in the main, we also provide contractual services and money through this organization, the ESU, Engineer Support Unit, to allow the Afghans to help themselves, to build roads, to build culverts, using local labor. The whole idea is to develop their infrastructure, but as well to distribute wealth. We could get the road done probably in two to three days using some of the high-tech, sophisticated military equipment we have available in theater. Don't do that. Hire a thousand of them and spend six weeks building that road. There's then pride of ownership, pride of having built it. We've paid them a wage of which they can be proud. And of course, they are in, in turn charged with providing security for their peers working on that road construction site. Provincial reconstruction team we've already talked about. In our case, it's five or six hundred folk. There's two rifle companies embedded within the provincial reconstruction team. There has to be, because at times we have to fight to deliver aid, which is kind of a bit of a numbing issue when you think about the implications. We have to fight to deliver aid. And their main remit is to protect the great civilians from the whole of government or the comprehensive approach, be they from Corrections Canada or Canadian International Development Agency or Foreign Affairs or the uh, prison system, some legal experts who go over there and try to help spread the rule of nascent Afghan institutions and rule of law. Next you've got uh, the military observers, national support element, and until very recently, it was kind of lonely in Kandahar. We've been fighting there hard since 2006, by ourselves. Our casualty rates are high. It's a tough fight. But a couple of months ago, thank you very much, two American battalions showed up. One mechanized infantry, the other military police. And they've been a godsend. And I'll explain why, in terms of some of the principles of counterinsurgency, so you can see the impact they've had. But simplistically, if you don't have enough troops to do that which you've set out to do to provide security, that means you're continually racing from crisis point to crisis point. And there's a term, it's called mowing the lawn. And so you're continually going in a circuit, mowing the lawn and re-mowing the lawn, spilling blood for land that you've already passed over once. The underlying premise of some of the precepts, though, in counterinsurgency theory is, by the way, land is not as important as the hearts and minds of the indigenous folk. So it's not a question of seizing territory. It's shaping and influencing local perceptions. Then you've got an aviation battalion, which has uh, 20 machines, uh, six griffins, so well, well, we had eight. We're now down to seven griffins. Um, six Chinooks and a bunch of other uh, helicopters, military police company who do the obvious things, medical company, 
And at one point, we ran the entirety of the very large uh, NATO hospital in Kandahar. It was just handed over to the Americans. I think the Canadian Medical Corps did brilliant work in that regard, saved lots of lives, both Afghans and Canadians. And a variety of staffs and UAVs. And then over in that little box in the corner, we've got a bunch of indecipherable acronyms, and those are folk who, um, who we don't talk about a lot, and they like to come out <coughs> at night. And they have very important work to do. Does everyone know exactly what I'm talking about? Okay. Capabilities. The single most important capability we have are our young men and women, our soldiers. But sometimes there's a perception that the Canadian Army is held together by gun tape and paper clips. Stop. Uh, just go back one slide, Andrew. That infantry battle group is the single best equipped battle group in Afghanistan. It's better equipped than the U.S. Army battalions. Wow, when was the last time a Canadian general came down to Washington and said that? <laughs> it is. Keep on going. Here are the vehicles we use. And I'll just give you rough numbers. 150-odd LAV 3s upper left. Essentially looks a lot like your Striker. You actually bought the Striker design from us. You chose not to put a heavy gun on the turret instead of a little wee machine gun. That's your call. <laughs> and uh, we put extra armor on the bottoms and sides. We've had a lot of casualties in those vehicles, not because they're bad, they are superb, but because they can get out and move around and you can't win this fight by staying in your camps. And so close to 80 of my soldiers have died in those vehicles, but they have the utmost confidence in them because the explosions have been very large. You've got a Leopard C2, which is a little tank, and we use those not, who here is an armored officer in the audience? We don't use them as most armored officers would envision using tanks in fairly significant numbers, thundering across the plain and blazing away with their gun barrels at other tanks on the horizon. No. That is an infantry support weapon. You send it down the track first. If it takes a hit, the little tank, the 45-tonner, can sort of shrug and might lose a tread or a wheel. It may be damaged, you haul it out of the battle area. I care not, because the crew's alive. They may be shaken up, you can get them out of there pretty quickly, and then the laughs behind them can punch through and get on top of the enemy objective and deal with them. Because I'd much rather have a tank taken on than one of my infantry carriers. Below that, you've got a really big tank, Leopard 2 A6 MC3+, Plus, just under 70 tons. And we're replacing, as they get damaged, the Leopard 2s, sorry, the Leopard C2, which is essentially the Leopard 1, with the Leopard 2. Same principle use. An old 113 reconfigured as a support vehicle, the Coyote is a reconnaissance vehicle, the RG31, which is sort of like a little MRAP. We have uh, some 777s with a precision capability so they can drop a shell 20 to 30 kilometers away through a window. It's expensive but not nearly as expensive as getting it wrong. So um, precision, precision, precision. And we don't use them. We only use them when we have to, but when we have to, we tend to hit hard. Armored engineer vehicles to help folk move around, expedient uh, obstacle clearing, <coughs> very useful once you find an IED and drag it out of the way, especially if there's a certainty that it's a first, second, third, fourth and now fifth level of trap. You find the IED, it's linked to another one five or six or meters away by a wire, which is linked to another one that's three to four meters away by another wire, which is linked to another one by another wire, and the final one is command detonated by some person hiding under a tarp a kilometer away watching you. Underestimate the foe at your peril. Next ones. We bought from the Americans, thank you very much, uh, mine clearance packages, the Husky, the Buffalo, and the Cougar that are designed to take the blast. I think the record now is four brave young men and women who strap themselves into that Husky. And it's designed, brilliant actually, to trundle down the road, hit the IED or mine. Uh, the individual then goes for a ride, usually upside down, shakes himself off, you replace the front wheels, and uh, away they go. 
truly brave combat engineers. We have a variety of UAVs, both small, SUAV, medium, TUAV, and large. We have armored trucks, probably the best in the world, and we have our helicopter fleets. Next one. Just want to quickly run through what our operational mentor liaison teams do. And we're there in the main, keeping in mind Canada's contribution to Afghanistan, though it's 3,000, it's quite sizable, and we're out there every day and night. If you look at the totality of the Afghan National Army forces available and the NATO forces available, it's about 3%. We present, represent 3% of the boots on the ground because NATO forces and allies are getting close to 70, 80, 90,000, and the Afghans themselves are approaching that number in terms of effectives. They coach, mentor, and assist in training units within the Afghan National Army, and they're out there with them, living with them day by day. It's a tough job. I have an unending stream of volunteers who want to go off and do that. Bless them all. Next one. The battle group, the hammer. It can operate either as a composite force, as a total package, or subdivided into platoon, platoon plus sized elements. Got to have it, because if you sit in your camps and wait the, for the foe to come to you, obviously you've seated the initiative, and they will get at those whom we're charged to protect. They will attack the representatives of the various Afghan institutions who are trying to spread their rule of their law. So you got to get out. Next one. The reconstruction team. Some sample projects. The key, though, is to ask the Afghans what they want. They're a proud people. One of the fatal flaws that folk can make is to arrive in a village that's existed in that location for probably 1,500 years and say, here's how we're going to help you. No, no, no. It's... How can we help you? What are your immediate needs? Why don't we sit down over a cup of tea in Ashura, not Ashura, in Ashura, with the leadership present and arrive at a decision that you will make where we can try and help you? And by the way, if our forces are attacked while we're building that road in your district, we're going to kind of hold you accountable. Next one. Whole government approach, the comprehensive approach. You've seen it mentioned in General McChrystal's report. It's often discussed in a variety of academic papers and tomes. What does it mean? It means it's a blend of civilian skills and military skills, of the soft side and the harder side. We can, and uniform, negotiate. We can set priorities for local, i.e. village, reconstruction. We can give advice on how to set up a judicial system, but you know something? We're not good at it. It's not where we have the training. It's not where we have the natural inclination or the expertise. The best folk to do that are those who do it for a living, which are volunteers, civil servants, aid workers, jurists, lawyers, humanitarian experts, and our job is security. It's all about security from our point of view. Not only security for the Afghan people, security for those who are trying to help them. So I'm not trying to suggest there's an absolutely crystal clear division of labor here, because there are places where our great civilian friends can't go. Two provinces in particular are really tough. Kandahar, where the Canadians are, and Helmand, where the Brits are. It's really tough the two by far toughest provinces in the country. But there are signs of progress. Despite what a variety of folk have written about, there are signs of progress. But it's still tough. Next one. We found something. And it may be self-evident and even intuitive to a whole bunch of people in this room. If you use infantry to train Afghan civilians and try to make them into policemen, after about eight weeks, guess what those Afghan policemen look like? And guess what they act like? They act and look like infantry. Now, stop. What are we doing? 
Now, Afghan police, bless the brave ones, do an awful lot of stuff that police in Canada and North America don't do. It's not too often you have firefights nightly in a variety of isolated police outposts in North America. That's a fairly routine occurrence in Afghanistan. But they've got to be policemen first. So we actually import federal police and provincial police and even municipal police on a voluntary basis to come out and teach those Afghan policemen how to be policemen. And then the soldiers take over at a certain point and give them refresher training on light weapons. How to fight and move within your patrol should you come under contact by insurgents. And it's work and wonders. Next. I like this slide. Remember I said we were the best equipped battle group in Afghanistan? That is a Canadian tank. That is a very large Canadian tank. And those are light infantrymen from the U.S. Army currently working with us. And that big Canadian tank has given them a hand. And overhead you have a Canadian, an American helicopter flying combat air patrol. Once again, for those tacticians in the room, tanks are employed individually or in pairs as an infantry support system. And believe it or not, and probably a bunch of you won't believe me, tanks tend to have a calming influence when they show up. It's really hard to argue with 70 tons of steel. You can, and they do, but usually not more than once. What I'd like to do now is try to wrap it all together in a very short video presentation that will show you what we're doing. It's only about four to five minutes. En Canada. <laughs> Why? Why would you laugh? Four to is that what I said? Four to five minutes? Oops. No, it's not 45 minutes. En Canada, nous sommes bilingues. Alors, les soldats qui viennent de retourner du, uh, du Kandahar sont des francophones. Alors, je vais vous démontrer un truc, une vidéo, bien sûr, qui, uh, qui ont des, uh, des vidéographes de nos francophones soldats superbes. OK. What I say. These are French Canadian soldiers because they're the ones who just came out of theater, just rotating out now. Almost they're about 98, 99% complete because we've got a rotation on the go. And uh, th their language is French. Obviously, we're a bilingual nation, so I'll run a little, I'll provide a little running translation for you and I'll also make one or two comments as the video progresses. So, where you go. Probably want to dim the lights just a little bit if that's okay, but I'll leave it up to you, folks. Rendu ici à Split, j'ai un point de dislocation. Mon détachement des armes va s'en venir ici. Va s'installer. Le déplacement, ça devrait être assez long. Ok, parce que vous voyez, il y a des champs de vignes. Canadiens, <coughs> Afghans, <coughs> interpreters, <coughs> all clustered around the same table. All speaking French. Don't Bravo go there. à droite, Pesso au centre. La C6 monte au midi. Les distances, ça va dépendre de la luminosité qu'on va avoir. On regarde le gars à vue. Ce qu'on veut pas, c'est briser la patrouille. Army Sergeant Major. We like the night. We're very good at it. You figure out where the foe is. You shape. Get local intelligence. You show up in your vehicles right away. They'll get away. So you creep up at night with the view to paying them a visit around dawn. Those are the two target areas, one each of which is to be taken out by sections. And you saw the arrow pointing towards the Taliban. And in this particular one, there's quite a large number. So first contacts established. Yes! 
That is the nest of the foe. Quite a large number of them. Controlled, aimed to fire. Tough young platoon and company commanders now have a choice. You bring in a thousand pounder from an orbiting aircraft which has a large blast radius. Or you use something smaller and just as precise. Canadian guns. The range is about 20 kilometers. And they can put it through the roof of a house with less collateral damage. So it's only 100 pounds as compared to 1,000. There's no need to show unpleasant bits. So there you have the mix of the Afghans and Canadians moving forward. A tank, roof clearance package. The infantry vehicles move forward to rebomb, refuel, rearm their dismounted infantry. And now what do you do? Clear, hold, build. So this is the clear with the action. Now you gotta do the hold and you need a little fortress, like for a platoon. And you can put it up in about six hours. This one. Finish your little outpost, populate it with Afghan army or police, one or two Canadians, move on, do it again the next night. Spreading, if you would, the rule of law. So that concludes my remarks. Hopefully I didn't go longer than expected. And I'm now available and willing to take your questions. Thank you for paying attention. I'm not sure how you want to do this, Bill. Uh, David, do you want to? Me to pick or you pick? Um, you can pick, but we, I would like you to wait for the microphone since we are uh, being webcast and we need that to pick up the sound. Um, so I saw a hand here. Let's go. You do whatever you want. I'll just. Do you want to go back behind it? Or? No, no, no. I think you're fine. OK. Ah. No. General, my name is Judd Harriet. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, at a recent conference in Washington, it was mentioned that perhaps we should be concentrating on training tribal militias rather than a national army. I don't know whether this gets you into your forbidden area of political statements, but maybe you can, you can comment on that. Is that a good idea in your opinion? Are you doing, are the Canadian forces doing that? So forth and so on. Right. Um, I will offer a personal opinion, and uh, it's not a forbidden area. It's an idea that's been kicked around for several years. I was actually sitting around the conference table with uh, your ambassador to Afghanistan, David Eikenberry, and, uh, who, who used to be a general, um, with uh, General Bismillah Khan, the chief, now the chief of the Afghan army, and a bunch of others. Um, and there was quite a discussion, 2003, as to how we tried to increase local security forces uh, without disassociating themselves or disassociating them from the traditional tribal elders who essentially act as the rule of their law, their local law, uh, amongst their young men. And for a variety of reasons, uh, the approach of the Afghan National Police and Afghan National Army was, was essentially uh, agreed to. So the Afghan National Army insists that, that there's a certain ethnic representation amongst all its units. So they don't want 100% of a certain unit to be Pashtun or Tajik or Hazar, whatever. So 
tribal militias. Tribal militias have a certain degree of uh, negative connotation. If you look back through the sweep of history, uh, a series of very good academic works and tribal logs are, are replete with cases of tribal militias thundering up over ridges and just ruining um, uh, sort of an expeditionary army's days that lies in the valley below. Y you know who I'm talking about here. <laughs> Several times over. Uh, and I'm not only going back to uh, Great Britain, but throughout the sweep of time, getting into Afghanistan has always actually been moderately easy. Getting out has been extraordinarily difficult. So uh, arming auxiliary forces and making them responsive and responsible to local elders, local authority figures, with a rule of law that flows from Kabul to, in our case, Kandahar, to the governor, Governor Vesa, who happens to be a Canadian, by the way, a Canadian Afghan, um, I think is an idea whose time has come. We have to build up security capacity. There's a flip side to this. It is not a panacea. And there's a danger as well. One could argue that the last thing that Afghanistan needs is more small arms. On the other hand, they're already there. So by providing a modest, modest amount of funding, you then tie security for a village with the village elder. Because right now, very often, the response when there's a tragedy involving our troops in a local area, you go and you speak to the village elders and they shrug and they say, well, I have no means to protect myself. Those folk weren't from my village. They're from somewhere else. And what do you want me to do about it? Because I have no remit to actually act as auxiliary forces. Long-winded answer to a very coherent, penetrating question. In the absence of anything else, which is a silver bullet, and I'm not suggesting this one is, why don't we try it? Why don't we try it? Now, the province of Wardak, uh, the Afghan minister's defense name is General Wardak, great guy. He comes from the Wardak province. They're starting this. Trial has been running for about uh, six or eight months. And all indications I've read are quite positive. So I think it's something worth pursuing. And I think it's something worth a whole bunch of smart folk in a room such as this one thinking, pondering, and writing about. Just in the back. OK, um, over here. There's a hand. Uh, hi, uh, Heather Price for the Heritage Foundation. Uh, you had said that uh, that you thought that boots on the ground was the uh, top of the spear, or the tip of the spear, sorry, in terms of uh, military effectiveness. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts to contribute about the debate about sending more U.S. troops. <laughs> there is a ferocious debate uh, taking place not only within the United States, but also within the corridors of power of NATO. Uh, you're all well aware of... Uh, General McChrystal's report. Um, you have seen the rough parameters of troop levels that are provided as options. It's all relatively open source. Um, every soldier wants more. That's a given. And the reason why we want more is there's a certain critical mass that will allow you to get your job done while minimizing casualties. Keeping in mind in a conflict such as these, casualties are always going to occur. I'm going to take a little bit of time to answer your question. Did you notice when I showed you the very little brief video, those excellent Francophone soldiers from a, uh, a glorious regiment called the Royal 22nd, Le 22 e Regiment, they went after a, a nest of the foe. And there was quite a lot of them in there, um, but there were many more attackers than there were defenders. Um, that allows you to shape the outcome, allows you to position your forces, allows you to try not to take unnecessary risks because you have quality and mass. If you've only got a really small team of three or four that's thundering around the countryside in a pickup truck, your options are limited. And if you know the bad guys are in that building, you can drop a thousand pounder or do nothing because you can't really go inside and sort them out one by one because you don't have the mass or the, or, or the precision. So we kind of like our way, which is when we find discernible clumps of the foe, make sure that 
collateral damage is absolutely minimized. You go in in large numbers, and then you actually go into the building. And you sort the good ones from the not so good ones. The more troops you have, the more you can do of that. But there's a couple of key questions you've got to ask. So can I ask them for you? All right. <laughs> What's the center of gravity? What's the overall aim? What type of mission success are you defining as where on a benchmark? And is that benchmark our scale by time or by activity? What are the political certainties, because arguably all politics is domestic, a wise one once said. Uh, what are the domestic constraints? And what sort of decision factors play into that? What are the international constraints? What is your goal? And when do you want to have it achieved by? And those are all quite properly political questions. Right? Absolutely. Because all of us Western generals, quite rightly, respond totally to the guidance that were issued by our political masters. So your original question was, what do I think about the various numbers going into Afghanistan? And my answer to you is, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> I'm in your capital, and I'm not, I'm not going to presume to offer advice to the US government while I'm standing here in Washington. And if I did, I would do so in private. So very good try, young lady. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Ken Chastain from Army G2. I'm also going to put you on the spot. I uh, ask you a question which you may not be able to answer. Uh, Canada is committed right now politically to withdrawing its combat forces by 2011. Is there any move that you're aware of or any feeling towards at least uh, retaining some capability there for training, for support, for other measures? Um, fair question. Um, I will give you the almost word by word the orders that I receive, which is that Canada shall cease its combat operations in Kandahar province by June 2011. And uh, Lieutenant General Leslie, you are to start planning forthwith for the withdrawal of all forces. That's what I got. Remember my introductory comments? We go where we're told. We fight the good fight. Achieve those conditions the government wants us to achieve. When we're told to come home, we come home. I may have very strongly held personal views on this, but they're personal, and we're all professional soldiers. So we're coming home in 2011 unless somebody tells me different, and no one has done so. Um, General, my, I'm unaffiliated. I happen to be English. Um, can I ask you, what is, the, what is your policy towards poppy and opium production in your area of responsibility? A complex issue. You know, I was, I'm going to bore you with a war story. Uh, in 2004, January I think it was, uh, President Karzai very kindly invited uh, myself and a bunch of others to a large uh, conference on what to do with the narcotics issue. And there were large numbers of religious leaders there and uh, ministers and warlords, and sometimes they were all the same person, and um, uh, power brokers, ambassadors. And uh, I've been in theater about five or six months, and uh, more importantly, so had the several thousand Canadians. So we were starting to get a fairly good idea of what was going on in Kabul and who was doing what to whom. And uh, President Karzai, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Abdullah and now his rival, were, were both there gave great presentations and um, mentioned that the rule of law, how it was against uh, certain tenets of, the, of uh, that wonderful and great religion, the Muslim faith. And as he was saying it, I, I was sitting next to, and I'm not going to mention his name because he's still very active, a general warlord, cabinet minister, who was probably the single largest narcotics dealer in northern Afghanistan. Whew. This is really tough. So let me answer your question. In the province of Kandahar, the uh, counter-narcotics uh, orchestration of events is run out of the governor's office. And there's a variety of mainly American-funded uh, organizations. But in terms of the pillar of responsibility, the British have done a great amount of work, mainly with uh, civilian experts, 
try and shape uh, responses and all that kind of stuff. If we find it, we seize it and destroy it. Uh, I have on not this last trip, but a couple trips ago, I go over every six months or so. It's holding a bag of poppy paste worth quite a lot of money. Um, but we destroy it right away for obvious reasons. If we find um, production facilities, which we don't often because those have been usually dealt with in Kandahar, unlike Helmand, um, they're destroyed. Do we actively drop everything to go out and find them? Do we have specialized teams that cruise up and down uh, and try and eradicate fields? No. No. You don't, in my opinion, use soldiers to do that when there's so many other things that have to be done. Um, I've walked through, as have perhaps some of you, poppy fields that are extraordinarily high, um, very rich. And until such time as crop replacement and a certain degree of confidence is instilled rule of law, it's really tough to wean the very often starving peasants off of being addicted not to the narcotic, but to the money. And here's part of the deal. You are going to grow poppies next year. Here is the seed. In exchange, I will provide you security. Um, you now owe me for the seed, so if the crop's destroyed, you still owe me. And uh, here is the minimum level of protection or production that I expect from you. It, it, it's not negotiable. You are going to do this, otherwise I will take your son out and kill him. Whew. Grim. Everyone's looking for the silver bullet on the narcotics issue. No one's found it. Mind you, there's many other countries in the world where no one's found the silver bullet in narcotics. And there's a variety of theories. I'm sure all of you have your opinion, but I'm not an expert. 